Hello everyone, this is Satish Resta with Easy Power. Today I'll be talking about secondary networks in distribution and this is going to be an introduction. Uh, we will talk about the modeling of various equipment uh, in the system inside Easy Power. We will also look at power flow analysis, short circuit analysis, arc flash, and then finally coordination of various protective devices. Looking at secondary networks, what are secondary networks? These are uh, low voltage substations where medium voltage is uh, supplied to transformers and low voltage side are interconnected so that there is more reliability in the supply in case there's any disturbance on the primary side. And uh, you can have two or more transformers connected. There are two main types of secondary networks. Uh, the first one is the spot network. And this is a minimum of two transformers connected to each other or parallel. Uh, and they supply to large commercial facilities or large buildings and are typically found in large cities. Uh, similarly, in large cities where you have lots of different blocks and a high density of load demand, uh, you would be having underground networks and lots of different transformers supplying to the primary grid as well as the secondary grid. Uh, and they're all tied together on the low voltage side and on the high voltage side. Uh, first, the spot network. What we have shown here is just an example. We've got two transformers in parallel. They're going to be in the same vault or in the same area. And at the top, you have the utility substation and the blue line indicates a medium voltage. Here we have modeled a 12.47 kilovolt system. So you've got cables uh, feeding transformers and these are two primary feeders separate and the transformer is connected to a network protector which is a circuit breaker uh, uh, activated by network protector relays which are slightly different from regular uh, overcurrent relays then they feed to a bus and these two buses are parallel in this example we've got a tie breaker in between the two buses uh, but in some cases, you can also have just one single bus being fed from both the transformers. And then you have fuses going out to the customer load centers. The next, this is just a very small example of a grid or area network. In large cities, you might have uh, many, many transformers, much more than this. And they'd be uh, located a few hundred yards from each other. So here, this is the utility substation. and uh, in this example, I've shown two feeders, primary feeders coming down to this city area. And uh, so every vault is going to have one transformer each and they supply via the network protector on the low voltage side to the low voltage bus uh, inside the vault. And between the different vaults, you have interconnection of uh, underground cables. And uh, in older systems, they may not be fused, but Nowadays, uh, it's a practice to put fuses in these uh, cable runs. So uh, you can see that this primary feeder is supplying this vault, then the next vault at the bottom, and then finally this. So this is just, again, uh, to repeat, this is just a small example. It would continue on to other vaults. So this entire cable system is interconnected, and they form one low voltage or secondary network. Now we'll go on uh, and discuss easy power modeling and uh, various types of analysis. Uh, in this session, we will be talking about a spot network example. I'm going to zoom in. Uh, so as I said earlier, this is a utility substation, two medium voltage feeders coming out. Uh, medium voltage is shown in blue color and low voltage is shown in black color in this example. Now if you want to do any color coding in Easy Power, you can do it by uh, going through the colors options. So I go to colors and set global colors. See this checkbox? If I uncheck it, everything is going to have a default color, all black. Now if I go to uh, back to the colors options, if I check this, I can change the color to anything that I want. For example, right now we've got the secondary as black. Uh, I can choose any color. So uh, let me set it to show the colors. There we go. Uh, 
So what we have is, you know, uh, an estimated load that is going to be consumed by uh, the commercial area. And we've got transformer sized uh, almost appropriately. And uh, we'll talk about the sizing uh, of transformers when we discuss power flow analysis. And uh, the transformers are usually directly connected uh, to this network protector breaker. So you'll see that in most cases, they're going to be mounted on the same uh, location. And uh, the network protector is operated by this network protector relay. Uh, the network protector relay uh, has uh, two main roles. One is if you have a fault on the primary side, then what's going to happen is since your low voltage side is interconnected, if you have a fault on the left side on the primary, then you've got power coming in through the second transformer going through this low voltage system and going back into this. Or if somebody is working, uh, you know, needs to perform a maintenance uh, work on the primary side, then they turn it off. And in the same uh, case, what's going to happen is the other transformer that is parallel is going to supply or backfeed into this primary system. So the job of this network protector really is to sense reverse power going into this transformer and trip this breaker or this network protector breaker. Uh, fuses mounted on network protectors, some have it, some don't, so that's an optional there. And uh, in this case, we have modeled the fuse, which is a current limiting fuse. And the reason for that is this circuit breaker has a slightly lower interrupting rating. And when it's combined with the fuse in series, the combined rating goes up, uh, up to 200 kiloamps. And as you add more transformers in parallel, the short circuit current is going to increase. So in this case, it's kind of limited uh, to something like 50 or 60,000 amps. So, uh, from the fuse, we have cables going down to this main bus, and uh, this bus distributes uh, power to the load area. So in this case, what I've done is just for power flow analysis, I have lumped the load as 1000 kV on either of these buses. And so this is one secondary network all inside the vault. On the side, on the left side that is, I have uh, made an approximate model just to represent the load. And this is another uh, secondary network uh, at a distance away. So the first thing I'm going to do is go into power flow analysis and see what it looks like in a normal uh, operation. So I solve for power flow. I can see the various currents. So this is the total watts and vars that I'm showing. Now, if you want to show it in amps or different unit, you can do that. So go to power flow options, go to one line output, and uh, at the bottom, you'll see display units. So you can choose whatever unit you want to display. For example, if you're interested in current in amps because you're worried about the ampacity ratings, then that is current in amps for the branches. Uh, similarly, for loads and generation, you can show either kilowatts and kilovars or kV and power factor. Or if it's larger loads, you can use mega instead of kilo. So I'm going to set it back to kilowatts and kilovars for now. Uh, bus voltage, you have the choice between per unit, volts, and kilovolts. I'll leave it as per unit. Uh, so this is the flow of watts at the top and in parenthesis this is uh, so this is uh, kilowatts and kilovars now uh, I don't see any problems uh, in this system on a normal run this indicates overload so I can turn it on and off right now nothing is being flagged as overloaded and this indicates voltage violation. I don't see any case where there is a tremendous amount of voltage drop. And uh, so those are some of the things that we will be looking at. Is the system, you know, adequately sized so that there is no overloads in the system? 
Now let's take a look at the case where either somebody is performing a maintenance operation on one of the primary feeders or there is a fault. Uh, for fault analysis we will uh, use the short circuit calculation procedures but for now what we can do is open up this breaker or switch and this gets open so this uh, so what happens is current stops flowing through this line but because the secondary side they're tied together uh, you'll see that there's a back feed into the transformer so uh, because there is a reverse power flow uh, what's going to happen is the network protector really is going to sense that and it's going to open up this uh, network protector breaker so I'm going to right click and simulate that manually click open so now you have no current going into this system. So same thing would happen on the other network protectors whenever one of the feeders is out. That particular circuit gets de-energized by the network protector. Uh, and so let's take a look at other things that's going on. All the load is now transferred or carried by this transformer on the right side and you can see some red colors that's giving you a warning color here and this percentage is saying hey it's 24 percent overloaded and same thing goes for cables it's 6.9 percent overloaded and the way I have modeled the loads right now is you know load fluctuates over time it can vary throughout the day in the 24 hour period and it can also vary season by season throughout the year and so this represents right now a peak load condition throughout the year. Now let's say uh, we want to evaluate whether this is, you know, this overloading is going to be a problem. Since this is a fluctuating load and this represents the peak, we know that this overloading condition is not going to last for a long time. So this transformer has, you know, uh, some amount of overloading capability at a higher temperature and uh, so it is able to sustain it for several hours. Now uh, let's see how the power flow solution is going to look like at a slightly reduced load. So what I would do is uh, choose all the loads. I'm going to select them. So holding down the shift key, if I create a rectangle, it selects the load. And I can go down and select these loads too. So all these loads have been selected. Now let's say that the load is slightly reduced as a, at a non-peak hour. So I go to scaling factor and uh, I'm going to change these values from 100%. 100% represents the peak value. Uh, let's say it's gone down to 70%. So I can put 70% out here. and click OK and you'll notice when I click OK the loads are going to reduce and it's asking do you want to uh, commit to this I click OK and then see from 600 something it went down to 500 something kilowatts so let's take a look at the overloaded transform so at a slightly reduced load we no longer have an overloaded condition so we can say yes this is adequately designed you know in case of failure of power on one side, you still have the other uh, transformer and the cables able to carry the necessary power to uh, deliver all the loads. Now uh, once the system is restored or let's say the maintenance work is completed, uh, this high voltage breaker would be closed. So this line is now energized and as soon as that is sensed, uh, what's going to happen on the network protector relay is uh, it's going to me measure the voltage on the line side as well as on the load side. Now remember load side does have voltage because this transformer is supplying it and the line side just recently got energized because we closed this high voltage breaker on the substation side. And uh, so after the relay senses that oh this voltage is slightly higher than the downstream voltage and they are in phase and uh, once that is recognized then it sends a command to this uh, network protector breaker to close so I right click and close it to simulate that and now we are back in service and this is 
back to the normal condition. Now, uh, one thing you'll notice is the flow, although there are parallel cases, uh, the flow is slightly different. And that is because uh, I modeled the impedance of the transformer slightly different. And even these cable lengths, uh, this is about 2,000 feet uh, in this case. And the right side cable is about 5,000 feet. Uh, so because of the impedance difference, your load sharing is going to be somewhat different. Uh, next, we will go into the short circuit analysis. So I click on short circuit button. And uh, we will start by faulting all buses. To fault all buses without selecting any bus at all, click on the fault button and you'll see all the faults. So right now this is uh, showing the arc flash energies. Let's look at the fault current. So this is the momentary, this is the interrupting and 30 cycle. In the case of uh, utility systems, the 30 cycle and 5 cycle currents are going to be very, very close to the momentary current. So we are going to just look at the momentary currents only. Uh, you can view A, B, and C phase currents. You can also view the positive sequence, negative sequence, zero sequence. And if you want to know what the ground current is, just click on the th 3i0 and that will give you the total ground current. So for now, we'll just look at the A currents. So in a three-phase fault, A, B, and C are going to be identical in magnitude, but the phase angle is going to be slightly different. Uh, I'm going to reset the faults. So right-click and clear all. So all the faults that have been performed have been reset now. And I'm going to start looking at what would happen if you had a fault on the primary side. So uh, there are several ways to fault it. Right now, let's take a look at this cable. If you had a fault uh, on this cable very close to the substation, you could fault this uh, substation bus as an approximation, or you can fault this if it's uh, closer to this fault. So I'm going to double click, and there's my fault current, and it's showing the A phase. There is the fault current angle, and you can see the branch currents. So this really is going to see 17.14 kiloamps at negative, one, negative 78 degrees. And uh, so right now what we're trying to do is uh, find out what kind of current flow would be seen by this network protector relay. Uh, so you can also view the A, B, and C currents. And uh, right now in easy power, what we display during fault is the current magnitude, current angle, the bus voltage magnitude, and the bus voltage angles. And in case you're trying to set any network protector relay in terms of pickup, what you would need to do is, if you're interested in setting the watts and vars, you can calculate that uh, after creating the short circuit report, and we'll show that to you in a little while. But using these magnitudes, currents and voltages, you can calculate the watts and bars. So uh, from this direction of arrow, you can see that there's a reverse current flow. And this really is going to sense it. And we'll trip this circuit breaker. Uh, let's take a look at the short circuit options. Now, uh, what we have shown in this one line is two decimal places. Now, if you want more or less, you can do that. Go to short circuit options, one line output, and you can vary the decimal precision display. And uh, there are other choices too. For example, the vector coordinates. Right now, we're looking at magnitude and angle. If you wanted just the magnitude, you can do that. And uh, so the most popular method of uh, showing the fault currents is in kiloamps. But if you're used to per unit systems, you can do that. Or if you want to display the MVA, it can do that too. Remote bus voltage right now is in kilovolt. If you want per unit, change to that and click OK. And that's the per unit value. Now let's take a look at uh, a different type of fault. This is three phase fault. They're not as common as line to ground faults. So click on line to ground. And if you have a primary side uh, cable being faulted, 
so this is what would happen. In this transformer, we've got a delta on the primary and Y grounded on the secondary. So uh, there will not be any ground currents. 3I0 represents the ground currents. Uh, see, you can see that it's zero. Uh, nothing is going to come from the transformer, but there is going to be some kind of back feed provided through the utility. If you take a look at A, B, and C phases, you can see that there's some amount of current, a very small, and depends, and that depends on the transformer. So if you want to increase the decimal precision, let's see what happens here. You'll see that uh, there's a small amount of circulating current. So it comes through the phases only, not through the ground, and circulates through the utility and uh, comes back to this faulted point through the phase A. Now, next thing we're going to do is take a look at the short circuit report. I'm going to click on SE reports. Uh, no check boxes here, so that means reports are not yet created. We have different types of uh, report formats. I'm going to check this box for creating momentary or half cycle report and uh, we will look at the symmetrical components format in case you know you have some relay settings and you need the uh, short circuit currents and voltages in symmetrical components plus minus zero then it's much easier to work with this. For now uh, the units I've uh, chosen phase amps and kilovolts instead of per unit. I click OK and uh, <clears throat> this is going to generate the report. To look at the report, go through window button and choose high voltage momentary report. So there is my report. And <clears throat> the first table gives you the positive sequence, negative sequence, and zero sequence uh, Thevenin impedances as seen from the faulted bus. And on the right side, you can see the symmetrical, asymmetrical amps, etc. And these are the calculated bus voltage at the faulted bus. A phase is being faulted in single line to ground. That's a convention that we use. And you can see the voltages on B and C phases. At the bottom, we have the branch contributions. Now, what I'm going to do next is uh, put the one line and the report side by side so that I can get a sense of uh, what kind of results we're getting at what location. Uh, I'm going to close out of this empty one line here and I'm going to close the arc flash hazard report window and I choose tile vertically. Okay. Now if you want to get more uh, space, see this equipment palette on the left side, I can close this and redo that command tile vertical and there you go. So on the right side we have this one line drawing. We have faulted the primary side and we are right now interested in looking at what happens on the secondary side. What kind of current and voltages do we get? So on this bus that's where this really is sensing the voltage. You can see uh, at a diagonal this is the bus voltage and uh, these are the currents that the CT is sensing. Now we are also interested in uh, in the report we want to put in the voltage on the low voltage side uh, or the low voltage bus because in the case that this is uh, opened up we still have uh, power being supplied from the other transformer. So I'm going to select this bus and this bus and then I will hit this button called remote VI and it's going to add a new table to the list. So you'll see that earlier we had just three tables. Now we had one, we have one extra table and the selected item has been placed here. So these are the voltages and it also will list all the remote currents. So uh, remote currents is going to be pretty much any item that is connected to these buses. Uh, so using this we can do further calculations to calculate watts and VARs flowing through and in order to do that what we can do is select this report first and click on Excel. It's going to dump all the data into Excel. Now once we have all that information in Excel 
uh, you have the voltage and the angles, voltage and the angles for A, B, and C phases, and same thing for currents flowing through. And in this way, we can use this information to write our own equations in Excel to calculate the watts and bars flowing through the network protector. Next thing we're going to take a look at is equipment duty analysis. And uh, so to look at equipment duty, I'm going to click on this equipment duty button. And then I will do fault all. And here I can see that this network protector is very close to being over -dutied. Uh To look at the report, go to SC report. I'm going to uncheck this and create a new report. And this is going to be equipment duty report. We have different options. I'll just choose the simple one. I'm going to include all devices and have a reduced format. Click OK. And that should create a report for you. I click on window and look at equipment duty report. So there's my equipment duty report. Looks like most of the items are all, you know, black. There's this one item in orange. It's not a violation, it's just a warning. That's because we have selected uh, an option, a threshold value saying if we are 10% close uh, to the rating uh, compared to the fault current, then just give a warning. So that's what it is. A negative 9.2 means, you know, you're within that 10% margin. Uh, so this breaker is rated for 30 kiloamps and our fault current passing through this breaker, the maximum current that is, is going to be 27.2 kiloamps. Uh, now there's one more thing that we do need to do. Uh, there is this current limiting fuse uh, and that is going to provide short circuit protection for this uh, protector. So what we can do is uh, with this combined rating, I can increase this from 30 to 200 and click OK. So when I do that and do fault all, I see that this is no longer overloaded or over -dutied. Let's take a look at the equipment duty report. And here we've got network protector one. So it looks like it's doing a fine job. Okay, uh, so uh, that's what we can do in the short circuit analysis. Check, you know, uh, what voltages and what currents we have so that we can adequately set our network protector release. Uh, before uh, going out of short circuit analysis, I'm now going to uh, close out all the reports and Okay, so the next thing we'll be taking a look at is arc flash hazard calculations. So to look at arc flash hazard results, click on arc flash button and you should be getting some arc flash results there. I don't see any, so let's see what's going on. Short circuit options, including main, integrated. Uh, in order to create the arc flash hazard spreadsheet or the report, check this box in the short circuit option and arc flash tab. Click OK and arrange for arc flash is going to give you at the bottom. So right now we're not getting any results because we have line to ground faults selected. What we need to do is go back to three phase faults and then you'll get your results. And uh, so there's my arc flash results. And at the bottom, you have all the report showing you the bolted fault current, arcing current, the trip time, uh, and you know estimated arc flash boundary and energies at the working distance. Uh, so let's take a look at what's going on, why we have such a high energy. Uh, one of the things that I have done in the system is I have customized my library and uh, the gaps between conductors have been modified to suit actual conditions. Uh, 
So if you look at this report, we have an equipment type called Vault. So this bus, I'm going to right click and look at the information on the database. So this has been modeled as a Vault bus. So these are solid rectangular conductors either hanging off the ceiling or installed somewhere in the vault where all these uh, cables from the network protector come in and uh, loads are connected to these uh, to this bus. So you can also call it collector bus. And uh, so this has 150 mm gap. Now typical switch gears, if you look at the IEEE 1584 standard, uh, their tables provide 32 millimeters. And we know from the arc current equation that uh, as the gap increases, your arc current is also going to reduce uh, by the equation given in their standard. I'm going to take a look at the library. Click on the E button at the top left and choose Open Library. Now, the STD LIB is my standard library that comes with the software. What I've done is I've created a new library which was customized to address some of the additional data that was required for underground networks. So I'm going to open up the library now. I go down to the section called Arc flash hazard and choose default. So right now for low voltage 480 volt systems I would need this category between uh, 200 volts and 1000 volts and uh, as we scroll down you can see the changes that I've made. For volt I have 150. Now uh, so this is where you can collect the data from your field observation or measurements and modify the data so that you have more accurate arc flash calculations. Similarly, network protector, we have a gap of 64 millimeters, which is, you know, you can compare to a regular switch gear, which is going to be 32 millimeters. So because of the larger gap, we are going to get less fault current or the arc current there. And one of the cases that we run into is the arc current being so small, the trip time is going to be very, very large. In many cases, it may not trip the fuses or the breakers, etc. So that's going to be an issue there. Uh, so that's why we have really high incident energy. Now, if we go to short circuit options and this is the default, 1,000 seconds, meaning, you know, it never trips or kind of doesn't. So IEEE 1584 talks about if the trip time uh, for the upstream device is very long, then it's reasonable to use two seconds as the maximum duration for arc calculations. But that is based on the assumption that the person in front of the arc will automatically move away and two seconds is a reasonable reaction time for the person to step back to a safer distance. Now, this is the case of a vault. There's not a whole lot of place to move back. If the vault is fairly large, you might be able to move back a few feet, but that's pretty much about it. So uh, you will need to be very cautious in what kind of time limit you want to use uh, in this case in case of a uh, of an arc flash incident inside a vault. So in any case these are very dangerous because the protective devices are not very fast acting for faults on the low voltage busts. Now if you were to have a fault on one of the outgoing feeders so this is going to a customer area and this is just one conductor. So what I've done is I've created buses and small conductors here, short ones, to represent you know, a faulted case. Uh, so let's look at this cable going out. I fault on this one. You'll see that the gap is just 13 millimeters. So what I've assumed is that the fault occurs because of insulation damage uh, on the cable 
and uh, when you have insulation damage your conductors are fairly close together because the conductors are pretty much touching each other and uh, so we have an R gap of 13 and 13 is pretty much prescribed as a typical value in the 1584 standard. So we have a very small amount of energy there and uh, if you look at this fuse, this is a current limiting fuse and it's a cable limiter and it trips fairly quickly. Uh, next thing we want to do is a fault uh, or represent a fault on this cable coming from the transformer down to this collector bus. And what I've done is created a similar cable and a very short one and uh, added a bus here. So this faulting this bus would represent getting a fault somewhere along this cable. So if I fault that, I still get high incident energies there. Okay, but uh, compared to this, so let's compare this. I'm going to select this bus and the main collector bus and fault both. Uh, you'll see that there is an arc gap difference and a huge difference. Because of that, see these arc currents, they're really, really small for the collector bus and significantly large for the cable, so faults on cables. And therefore, we have a fairly fast trip time that is just 1.2 seconds and we have an incident energy of 54 calories which is again pretty high that's pretty much like a uh, extreme danger case and uh, what i would like to summarize is when you do arc flash calculations the first part and an important part is data collection do look at the gaps it's very important because if you assume just default from the standards or whatever is your usual practice for regular switch gears that may or may not be the case in the case of these secondary networks. Now, uh, there are some cases uh, of secondary networks where rather than a collector bus just hanging uh, on the ceiling six or eight inches apart, you might have a regular switch gear fitted inside the fault. In that case, it might be as low as 32 millimeters. So again, but that is something that you do need to verify before you carry out arc flash analysis. In most cases, we are dealing with a situation when we have a fault, we have multiple fuses that can trip. And uh, so in the case of arc flash, we have several methods for evaluating. Uh, see this option, calculate arc flash using. So right now, the momentary method is the default method. Momentary method is a single pass method. What we do in this algorithm is from the faulted bus, we traverse upstream, we look at the different trip devices. When there are trip devices in parallel, we take the longest duration trip time. Now, as the system gets more complex, you can have different fuses or you know, uh, different devices tripping at different times. And in order to get a more accurate result, a single pass calculation may not be uh, adequate, such as in this case of momentary method. So the preferred method is using the integrated method. Integrated method calculates in small time steps and in each time step, it will evaluate the short circuit current, the arc current. It will also evaluate each of the trip devices and uh, will decide when it's time to trip. When it's time to trip, the program automatic, automatically opens the circuit breaker or the fuse and continues with the evaluation until there is absolutely zero current in the circuit there on the faulted bus. So when we use integrated method, it gives you a much more robust and accurate calculation. So uh, those are some of the pointers in how we can perform arc flash calculations. Now, earlier uh, we talked about 
line to ground fault being the most common type of fault. So when we switch to line to ground fault, we are not really getting any currents. That's because uh, IEEE 1584 equations are all three phase equations for our fault calculations. And uh, we have implemented only these three phase uh, calculations. And if you want to do any arc flash calculations, IEEE 1584 again says, uh, just use the three phase equations and that will give you conservative, it'll be high, but you know, it's giving you conservative results. Uh, so just stick with the three phase calculations all the time. Next, we will take a look at coordination. Uh, I'm going to go back to the database edit focus. This is where you enter all the information and uh, build your one line drawing. I'm going to take a look at this network protector relay. So I have selected a network protector relay, but uh, on the spreadsheet you'll see this plot TCC and these are unchecked. If you want to check it, you can do that. Now the reason I have these as unchecked is this relay here has a directional property. It trips only on reverse power flow or reverse current. Uh, into this or back feed into this transformer and therefore for regular purposes I do not want arc flash calculations to use the trip times from this so what I'm doing is telling the program uh, as long as uh, this is unchecked do not include this uh, for analysis purposes either for coordination or for arc flash calculations so uh, in our case, what we're going to do is look at different types of protective devices. We're going to look at damage curves and see what kind of coordination we do have. I'm going to start off by selecting the primary relay, going down through the cable to the transformer. And select all these down to the cable and then all the way to this collector bus and the fuse in the outgoing cable to the customer area. Then I go into coordination and plot my TCC. Now uh, for the viewers, you may be seeing a smaller and hard to read uh, TCC here. In order to get a larger viewer area, what I can do is right click on the ribbon and choose minimize ribbon. Now. In some cases, if you're using a laptop, uh, the default is that we show the title block. So with the title block, see, this title block takes more space, so it's, you know, there's less space for the TCC area. So the option is for a small uh, screen, turn off the title block. Uh, okay, so let's start from the relay. The purpose of this utility relay is to protect this feeder in the case of faults. And uh, so this is the damage curve, the blue, light blue line, and that's the full load amps for this cable. And the green one is the relay that's on the utility side, protecting this field. So uh, looks like the maximum fault current that you can have is represented by this. I'm going to zoom in. So that's uh, 33 kilo amps asymmetrical current. So the symmetrical is going to be less than that. If you want to see the symmetrical current, you can follow this. It's going to be about 23 kiloamps. So at 23 kiloamps, it's going to take about, so I'm going to put my cursor to the shape of a crosshair. To do that, just hold down the control key and your arrow will change into a crosshair. So to view the time, what you can do is take a look at this status bar. So uh, take a look at this. I'm going to take my cursor way up to the top. It says it takes around 0.368 seconds. Uh, so that's the amount of time it's going to take. And we can see that the cable is not going to damage. The relay is going to trip faster than that. Now, for the purpose of coordination, if you do need to do that, you may need to take it higher. In most cases, uh, utilities prefer to take the trip time a little bit higher than this. Uh, so I'm going to fault all buses and 
there I see some fuse curves. So let's take a look at what's being displayed. This breaker right now, we have not modeled any trip units, that is either solid state or non-solid state trip units, dashboard type. So you can see that this is all blank. So it's not going to plot any TCC curves for that. Uh, really, as I showed you earlier, the plot TCC checkboxes are unchecked. So you will not be able to see any relay curve. And in order to uh, see the relay curve, what you can do is check this box. So this is going to be a directional relay. And if you scroll to the left side, you'll see that, oh, there is this relay curve, uh, but it needs to be enabled. So this is the level of adjustment that is available in this. Uh, particular relay. So the relay is on upon reverse current or reverse power, the relay is going to take about five cycles. So I'm going to zoom in so that you can see this. And I'll also enlarge this format plot area and go to text. Right now we have small, I can choose large and you'll see large enough to see it. So it's taking about eight cycles, 0 0.08. Three. Uh, so that's the time it takes to trip. Next, we will take a look at this uh, current limiter on the network protector. We'll also take a look at the cable limiter uh, that is protecting the outgoing cables. So uh, the outgoing cable fuse is on the left side and this right side represents the network protector fuse and you can see that they're well coordinated. Uh, if you have a fault on this, you'll see that uh, it takes a certain amount of time for it to clear. So by the time uh, this feeder fuse clears, uh, this will not have melted yet. So you can see from this right side, it's going to take uh, some time uh, to melt, maybe a little over a half cycle. And since this is a current limiting fuse, within less, with less than half cycle, this will have cleared. Uh, now, in some cases, uh, the breakers or the network protectors may have overcurrent protection that is not directionally sensitive. In most cases, it's not going to have it, but in case you do need to put that for some sort of protection, uh, you can uh, add a relay function there and uh, model it. So let's do that for now. And that's your uh, phase overcurrent curve. And uh, providing coordination, will require short circuit information. So what I'm going to do is fault on this one. And you can see that uh, there's this fuse curve here. And you will need to coordinate this circuit breaker uh, control using this overcurrent really out here. OK. Uh, so that is what we can do for coordination. In most cases, you're not going to have overcurrent protection on these relays. So I'm going to turn it off for now. Now, one thing to keep in mind is this all changes, all of these changes that we've been doing are inside this TCC focus. If you close the TCC and then plot another TCC, Notice on the left side, you no longer have this L-shaped curve for this reverse current. See, this is unchecked again. So what you need to keep in mind is when you plot TCCs, anything that you change with respect to this checkbox, so only this checkbox uh, is limited within that particular TCC. Once you go out and plot another TCC, you're not going to get that data back. Now, if you make changes, let's say to the settings, out here that will get stored and the settings are always going to be global. So those are some of the tools you can use for the purpose of coordination inside 
uh, in order to analyze these uh, low voltage or secondary networks. Uh, so that's all we have on spot networks for now. Uh, in future, we can talk a little more about in detail about uh, network protector relays and different functionalities and automatic control systems, etc. Uh, if you have any questions, what I'll do is go through them and it'll take me a few days to uh, get back with you, but I will send you an email with Q&A from everybody and email that to the whole group that attended this webinar. Thank you very much. Have a good day.